Hi, this is Martin. We are here at KubeCon in San Diego, and today we have once again with us Kelsey Hightower. You don't need any introduction, so I will not even bother with awesome. that. Uh, your keynote was incredible. You know, people are still talking about it. And um, so the, I was looking at one Twitter like, when you have a storyteller on the stage, nobody is like, you know, everybody just paying attention to. And we have talked about your, you know, your, your technique that you use for keynote. Yep. But I'm curious about what was the keynote ab about, all about because I missed it. Yeah, so this is the first time I've ever done a keynote with no demo, no slides, no speaker notes, uh, just a collection of stories. And the whole goal this time was uh, to make people feel something, right? To inspire them from that human connection. So there was no technology to lean on as a crutch. And it's the first time I've ever had to just be me and the audience without this backdrop of either technology or some screen that's glowing at them. So it was definitely a first time for me. And I think a lot of people have seen tastes of that because I always weave a story around all the technology, but we really drilled down into what it was like going from the very first KubeCon before it was called KubeCon, we called it the Kubernetes Gathering, and we paced ourselves through what it means to be um, representative in the tech community with very concrete detail, and then also capping it off with like this marathon that we're in and told the story of, uh, there's a marathon at Elliot Kipchoge, and he did the sub two hour marathon and explaining how he was able to do that, right? Having a set of, a group of pace setters coming in and out to help keep the pace and reminding people that we're just pace setters and the marathon runner in this case is all of the projects that are represented by these communities. And you don't have to run the whole race. You can come in and out and you're a pace setter. So that was kind of the theme of the keynote. And I think we did a good job of really connecting with people emotionally, and I think people felt something. So I, I consider it a success. Uh, why did you choose this format and this story for this event? Anything specific that you? I've been pushing people to grow for years. When I've introduced Kubernetes and whether it's Istio or Envoy, all these technologies, it's an attempt to let them grow technically. But there's also some growth that was required for myself. So leaning on my, my crutches and my props, those are very natural. They're fairly easy, even though they're risky. But taking them all the way gave me an opportunity to grow. So you're in front of 12,000 people and you're exposing yourself or you're becoming vulnerable in a way that you've never done before. So I had to push myself to be more descriptive, find better stories, tell better stories, and then stay connected with the audience and not fall back. So people got to watch me grow on stage the same way I've been asking them to grow. And you also cut down on the conferences you were attending this year. Yeah, so internally, I've been doing so much more work. Internally, we're doing a lot on, let's say, Google Cloud, where I spent a lot of time in our serverless world. So I've been learning a lot more in terms of cloud. And what I've started to do is substitute a lot of the conferences for spending time on site with the customers, right? Because you go to some conferences, and at a conference, everyone's kind of meeting each other in passing. You might get lucky and drill, drill down into some use cases. But when you go on site, with the customer, you're in their house, you're in their territory. You get deeper stories, you learn more about real problems, and now we can take all of that technology and map it to this real world. So I spent the last two years really doubling down on that subset of the community we just happen to call customers. Uh, so the community is growing, the use cases are growing. Um, I was at a Spinnaker Summit, which is like co-hosted, and they're, the, they're talking more about Kubernetes than <laughs> Spinnaker. So uh, first of all, uh, from the Kubernetes perspective, you know, how do you look at these new use cases, new uh, workloads that are coming to it? The way I've been thinking about this whole Kubernetes kind of growing and expanding is like the web, right? We have the internet, you have the web, and you have people making web pages, and there's links, you click on them, and URLs and domain names. And out of that, we extract REST. And you take that subset of HTTP and the things that you need, and now you can build RESTful APIs, you can build GraphQL, you start to have all these other things. There's databases that now just have a pure HTTP API. So that subcomponent of the web, we managed to extract out. If you think about Kubernetes, right, there's this big control plane, there's a data model, and the first system we built with it was this container orchestration tool. But if you take out the API, you can map it to all kinds of other issues. So you see it in CI CD, you see it in service meshes, and you've seen it for all these use cases because it's a great platform that has been battle tested for this original use case. So that's been the kind of mental mapping that I've been able to do. And it makes sense to me now why people are gravitating towards the Kubernetes style API to build these complex systems. Because at this point, almost every system needs a control plane. Why not start with one that's kind of been battle tested and has proven itself over the years?
But uh, we have seen this with other projects like OpenStack is a very good example because everybody was getting on board. Do you also fear that you know people are, or do you think that every project goes through the hype cycle and then you know uh, because everybody wants to try the new thing, new shiny thing? I think OpenStack really wasn't built in the way that it was going to ever see itself extended in this kind of way. I think OpenStack was after a different purpose, building a private cloud platform. So it really kind of put itself in almost in a box in many ways, right? Design it to run on prem, and it's people trying to build the cloud, right? Whereas Kubernetes, we learned a lot from all these communities, right? So thanks, Lee, for all the challenges that we saw come from the OpenStack world and many other communities before that. But when you look at the design of Kubernetes, we started with the API first. We didn't start with a system that did any particular thing. We started with this API model. We started with a storage mechanism, and they said, now that you have these two things, what can you build? Well, we could build a container management system. So the scheduler was pluggable by default. The container runtime is pluggable by default. So you saw this community mature. It matured around this very stable architecture. So that's why it's so easy to take that one piece out and continue to build with it. Whereas I think in the OpenStack world, it was all together as one unit. You really couldn't separate a piece out without almost changing the whole thing, right? This is why I think OpenStack upgrades were so painful. When a new vendor would come in, they would almost have to change the entire networking model to get their thing to fit. Whereas in Kubernetes, it's just been modular by default. And I think that just comes from some of the rich history of learning from all these other projects. Yeah, I think there was a, so many reports that almost 70 or 80 percent of OpenStack users are still running unsupported versions because it's so hard to just upgrade and move there. Um, uh, we're also seeing a lot of vendors coming in in the Kubernetes space, uh, and they are like setting up their projects. Uh, so I think uh, now there is a sandbox. Uh, earlier it was just incubation and graduation. So how do you plan to like allow companies to come and become part, at the same time not like lose focus or blow it too much? This is always a problem, right? Anytime there's um, lots of products, a marketplace eventually emerges. This, is, this just has something to do with these other subsystems. So I think that the way you look at all these projects and they show up right now, maybe CNCF is becoming this open source marketplace. GitHub is still a marketplace for a lot of tools and libraries and languages. Cloud providers provide a sort of marketplace. So you can always have these marketplaces, right? And right now the gravity seems to be where it is now. But that's just kind of an old problem and now this is just one of the newer solutions to it. So to me, that's just very natural, right? You have a offering, you wanna get eyes on it, you want it to be easy to find. So why not go into what most people consider this very prominent infrastructure open source marketplace. And that's the way I kind of look at it. So where you can come get some users, maybe even build a community. So I can understand why people gravitate to it. I think it's up to the users to really be a little bit more pragmatic, right? When you go to the store and even if you walk down every aisle, you don't pull everything off the shelf and put it into your basket. You know your diet, you know your menu, and you know what you need. And I think that's where people have to kind of contain the excitement, not overbuy, right? You never go to the grocery store when you're hungry. So I think companies have to really sit down and say, what is our actual pain point? And then when you go out to a conference like this, even though there's like a big shiny tool to handle some large scale problem, look, if you don't have that large scale problem, hey, call that a win. No need to bring in a solution for a problem you don't have. Uh, as these new projects are coming in, uh, and like sometimes what we do see, there are projects within CNC of which might seem like overlapping uh, or, or, but at the same time, there are a lot of gaps also. So where do you see a lot of overlap is happening and where are the glaring gaps that are still need to be filled? It's going to be very hard to build one tool that works for everybody. Mm -hmm. And that's what we identify as gaps. So right now, I think there's stages to the CNCF projects, right? There's sandboxes and those are free to overlap because everyone's coming to play, right? We don't know if which ones are going to mature and graduate, right? So we know Istio went through that and or not Istio, but um, Kubernetes has gone through that process and it's graduated. Prometheus has also graduated. But until they graduate, you're gonna to start to see you know, competing products. Some may not gather a community. Some may not evolve at the pace that the industry needs. So I think you're just gonna see that always be pretty big. And I think the graduation process is the thing that says, hey, these projects have sustained the test of time. And I think the ones that are graduating, they have a common theme, they're extendable. So when people do need to fill the gaps, the community can stay within that project versus create a new one. The overlap usually comes from a project will show up, but it's not very extendable. So then what happens is someone almost has to create another project based on those ideas, but with a slightly different twist. And I think it's gonna to continue to happen until we find one that hits the right sweet spot, 
with a balanced extensible endpoint so that way people don't have to start over from scratch. But we have also seen example of open sensors and open tracing and they merged to become open telemetry. So, and that's I think good, you know, when, when things are under one you know, organization, it's very easy, you know, to do, do those kind of things, otherwise that would never happen. But you almost need that, right? It's just like any evolutionary process. We need to take an idea and sometimes it's just better to try something else off to the side. And what you can see in those two examples, those two communities are basically doing fundamentally the same thing and there's no value at that point of splitting the mind share. So you come to the table and say, hey, we have very similar goals. There's only a little bit of delta between the two. Let's resolve it. And that's gonna be natural. Some projects will do that, some projects won't. What are the, what are the major you know, problems that Kubernetes community is still facing that you still need to solve? Because now it's getting into production, you know, people are, you know, uh, so what are those? The biggest challenge I think is Kubernetes comes out with a different way of thinking about it's the same problem, right? We have a lot of machines. Configuration management has its own take on that problem. Custom homegrown solutions has a take on that problem. Even cloud had a take on that problem. Passes have a take on that problem. And so when Kubernetes enters the market, it's right, right below a pass, but above some of the custom tooling most people have been building. So it takes this very opinionated approach. Everything must be a container. You must have a declarative config. And it just has a way of thinking about the world. Now, as you start to mature, you're bringing in new audience. So now you're past the early adopters. So the biggest challenge is, is most people look at Kubernetes and says, well, it looks very familiar to how I was doing things before. So we spend a lot of time trying to make the new thing work the old way. So if you have an existing investment in a security tool that you bought, maybe it's a logging tool that you bought, you may want now the community to stop and integrate with everything. And anywhere you don't see a proper integration, then you may say, well, Kubernetes isn't mature. Or you may say, um, it's not quite ready for my use case because I can't change everything. So I think that's where we have a healthy tension going on. So if you're used to doing load balancing one way and out of the box Kubernetes assumes one thing, that's just gonna be a lot of friction for you. And if you don't know what the fundamentals are, you may mistakenly go and get some really immature load balancer just because it supports Kubernetes and it may crash and it may not be mature. So I think that's where we just have to be a bit careful. That's the biggest thing. Everyone's, no one knows what they don't know. I have a question regarding containers and I was talking to Dirk Honda from VMware. He, yes, that has been his pet peeve is that uh, the supply chain in containers, no, you don't even know where the, so it's creating a lot of security issues and compliance issue. Does that concern you? No, the thing is, that's again, that's an old problem. Yeah, if I give you a virtual machine mm -hmm. and you put Linux on it, and you do yum install random software from some repository. It comes down, it brings a bunch of dependencies. I'm a developer. I have my application. I'm also bringing dependencies outside the operating system. I'm bringing them from random sources from GitHub. I found this package on the internet and it made it work. You take these two worlds. So even if you knew everything on the server, you have no idea what's coming in on the developer side. You combine the two. This has been a problem for 20 years. All containers do is take that same paradigm they take the OS and they move it as a base layer. They take the developer's app and they move it here. The difference now though is this is repeatable. I can without a doubt rebuild this software 5,000 times. So now we at least have a baseline to secure, a baseline to say this is our software inventory. And now you can do something about it. Now that we're decoupled from the machine, we don't have to install random stuff on all of our servers. We can now push the dependencies to be isolated to the app. So guess what you can do now? If you know what your dependencies are, like in the Go community, I can remove the entire base layer. I can just, like you don't, if you remove the entire OS, there's nothing to scan. It's not even there. So now that I'm only bringing my application, it's statically compiled, now the contract is between my app and the system calls provided by the kernel. So you're not scanning this whole layer now goes away. You can lock down the operating system, kind of like we do in Google Cloud, where we just have, um, we call it the container optimized Linux. It's read only, works a lot like a Chromebook a lot less to secure in that model. So now this application stack starts to shrink. And now you start to move the problem where it originally was. What dependencies are you sucking into the application? That was a problem you have with VM. That's not a container problem. That's a software development right, yeah. problem. But remember, making the new world work the old way where people tuck that VM and then stuffed it all into a container. And of course, they just moved that same security problem, patching the scanning servers. They're moving it with the container and they're making the problem follow. So I understand why people say it's a challenge because the way people were patching things before, their tools wasn't that scalable. 
the machines just kind of stuck there statically. Where now in the container world, it's moving and going all the time. And now you're putting whole operating systems from the internet and running it into your cluster. And that's where I think the alarm comes from is because people aren't paying attention to the original problem has just now shifted. And for the, some reason, people find it okay to bring random operating systems, including random apps, into a cluster. So I think it's a discipline problem that we got to make sure we understand. I mean, you mentioned Linux, so if you look at desktop Linux or d Linux distros, they were like gatekeepers. You know, you, you just uh, enable the repository, but they have maintainers. They will ensure the package is secure. So, but you, so you're building everything from source. You do know what was there. Yeah, yeah but think about how sophisticated the security vulnerabilities are these days. They're so sophisticated that, yes, maintainers are doing a great job, but the CAVs have never stopped. Right. And right. it's too much work also, you know, for every every distribution has their own maintainer for the same app. So yeah, I mean Look what know, happened to OpenSSL. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So I think I don't think there's like been a proven de facto standard for best in breed of security. It's just that we've magnified the original problem when containers came out. So it's not a new problem. Mm -hmm. It's just now we're forced to really deal with it now because it's now being spread faster than before. I think. Uh, I mean, of course, I always, every single time I ask a personal question and I'll ask one, one more time. And that, that's <laughs> I'm actually laughing. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, I, you know, your stage presence, everybody, you know, so I just want to, last time also ask and this time also, what is the secret where you keep coming up with new, you know, you keep challenging yourself, you know, you can very easily just do a keynote like everybody else does. Why do you do that and how do you do that? If it's not a secret. <laughs> no, there's no secret though. So uh, there's a, I won't say the whole song, but there's a rap lyric where he's it's like, you're, you're only as good as your last hit. So if you're a musician, most people like your first album, right? They identify you to that genre, that style of music. And as an artist, some artists want to be creative. Maybe they like multiple genres. So when an artist that's known for one particular genre, let's say it's hip hop, and they go do a country album, well, all the hip hop fans may say, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? Like, I don't like country music. So they may not be able to resonate with it. But at the same time, you have to push yourself in order to grow. So if I do a talk and someone says, yo, that talk was amazing. For me, mentally, I just move the bar one level up and say, hey, I'm not going to keep doing this if I can't periodically raise the bar. So if I watch other keynote speakers, I say, what do I like? And the things that I like, I also want to bring to people because I also want them to like them. So what I try to do is like the things that I like, I like how comedians that can own that stage, make their presence, make people feel a thing and make people think. I want to do that because I enjoy it. So the things that I enjoy, I strive to be able to, to give to other people. So that allows me to look at my past talks and say, can I make the next one even better? And when I can't do that, then that's when it's time to stop. Do you still watch your past? Like, oh my God, that one was... I can't watch them. Number one, because... I remember the moment on the stage, and sometimes the moment on the stage is magical. Like it's very surreal, if people are laughing, if people tear up. That moment, that's the only way I understand that talk. So if I go watch it on video, it doesn't look so dramatic, right? It's just me and a camera, and doesn't really capture the whole live performance of the audience, the lights, the temperature. So watching it through the camera, it's never the same. So. I can't watch them all. Now, there's some that I've watched over and it's like, wow, I am pretty good at this thing. I'll watch a talk and I'm laughing the whole way through like, this guy is amazing. And I think I did a talk at Monitorama. And I didn't actually, I just kind of put the talk together last minute, bad thing. But it was hilarious. I'm going through this talk. The live demo was perfect. I'm making up stuff on the fly. And there was just like a bunch of comedy. But we still landed this very clean technical message. So when I rewatched the talk, I was like, that was great on camera, that I could actually watch it and appreciate it as, as, as a performance. Which one was this talk? It was Monitorama. I forget what year it was, but it was the first time I've ever given a talk at Monitorama. It was a very simple topic around health checks. Mm -hmm. and, I just, and I just walked through live what it's like when you don't have health checks. And I was telling this story about what it means to wake up in the middle of the night and there's no health checks. And I'm debugging live and I'm playing this scenario and the audience is a perfect fit because they've all woken up in the middle of the night when you don't have the right debugging tools in play. So that was just like, it was just a match made, it was perfect. <laughs>